Synovian is proud to be a long-standing sponsor of the Pharma Voice 100 celebration. We salute Pharma Voice for honoring our industry and recognizing inspired leadership. Throughout the last 16 years, Synovian has stood together with the innovators, change agents, and other leaders in the Pharma Voice 100, recognized for advancing women in life sciences, cultivating intellectual and scientific freedom, leveraging digital health expertise, and collaborating globally to drive innovation. We have joined the Pharma Voice 100 in redefining the life sciences ecosystem. And today, we join you in raising the bar. At Synovian, we take on tomorrow for patients because for them, tomorrow is everything. It is the promise we make and the challenge we give ourselves every day. Take on tomorrow. Learn how we take on tomorrow for patients at synovian.com. Proud sponsor of the Pharma Voice 100 celebration. On behalf of all of us at Synovian, I'd like to express how thrilled we are to be a long-standing sponsor of the Pharma Voice 100 celebration and to support this important industry event, which has been reimagined this year. For 16 years, Pharma Voice has recognized inspired leadership and breakthroughs in our industry, and I'm honored to be a part of this program. Together with my fellow Pharma Voice 100 honorees at Synovian, we have joined together with those who have redefined the life sciences ecosystem. And today we join you in raising the bar. Now is the time to raise the bar for our patients when they need it the most. I have found throughout my career that if you put the patient first in decision making and product design, you'll make the right decision, even in the most challenging times like the one we're all experiencing now. And I believe we can raise the bar for the next generation of innovators, encouraging greater diversity of experiences, ideas, and backgrounds. As we all blaze the trail for the next generation of future leaders, as we prepare for their leadership, our industry will continue to push the boundaries of new scientific and technological frontiers to solve major healthcare problems, and make tremendous impact for this society this year and well into the future. For example, at Synovian, we're committed not only to reducing disease burden and bringing forward new treatments, but also to addressing the stigma and challenging the status quo on behalf of people living with serious medical conditions. This is particularly relevant in the area of mental health and with a range of neuropsychiatric illnesses. At Synovian, we're using a variety of tools to make it easier for the patient to seek and receive treatment, despite the difficult circumstances. It will take all of us working together across stakeholder networks to reinvent how treatments are discovered, developed, and delivered, and to find ways to prevent the onset of illness while improving our outcomes. We agree with Taryn that the industry must take advantage of this most important moment to step up and be extraordinary, to raise the bar, to make significant and lasting changes for the betterment of healthcare and people worldwide. We share that mission and look forward to the transformative changes we can all influence as we collaborate globally to drive innovation. I would now like to hand over to Taryn, who will facilitate the signature red jacket panel. Enjoy this session and the rest of this year's unique Pharma Voice 100 celebration. All right, so now this is one of the prime features of the Pharma Voice 100 marathon celebration and we are proud to bring you the first ever red jacket super panel so let's meet our esteemed red jackets who were kind enough to donate their time for this session al altamari chairman and ceo Algi Ther agile therapeutics it's late jeff berkowitz chief executive officer real endpoints sharon callahan 
CEO, CDM. Don Dieso, Chairman and CEO, WCG. Nancy Dreyer, Senior Vice President, Chief Scientific Officer, IQVIA. Cameron Durant, Chairman and CEO, Humanogen. Barry Green, President, El Nylum Pharmaceuticals. Amir Kalali, Chairman, CNS Summit. Michelle Keefe, President, Commercial Solutions, Cineos Health. Craig Lipset, Managing Partner, Clinical Innovation Partners. Andrea McGonigal, General Manager, Health and Life Sciences, Microsoft. Dave Ormisher, CEO, Closer Look Inc. Anal Pirohit, Pirohit Navigation. Mike Rea, CEO, Idea Pharma. Julie Ross, President, Advanced Clinical. Lee Ram Siegel, Chairman and CEO, Click Group. And Wendy White, Co founder, Rarity. Taryn, I don't know how you're going to harness all these amazing minds. But um, I'm inspired and I'm ready to start the super panel. You know, at Pharma Voice, we've been saying since the pandemic hit that the life sciences in industry has the opportunity to be extraordinary. Why go back to normal? Let's raise the bar, which is the theme of this year's event. You all move mountains, you can leap tall buildings, and all of you as Red Jacket super panelists are at the forefront of reimagining what's possible and leading us to a better place. So the big questions on everybody's minds are what's next and how do we get there? Um, we have five questions that we think hit on some of the biggest trends leaders are facing today as they strategize and carve out their tomorrow. We will ask you, the audience, the same five questions we pose to our panelists in advance. We will tally the results and then we'll ask our RJSPs, because I can't say Red Jacket Super Panels all night, um, to show how they answered the question. And then, they will, then we will hear their insights as to why they answered the way they did. So if you all are ready, I'm ready. Dan, launch that first poll. So we'd like to know, that being an effective leader is expected to be especially challenging in the next 12 months. Which of the following will be the biggest test for the industry or your company? Is it creating the right work environment, supply chain issues, business development, or maintaining customer relationships? So we'll get the audience to chime in and we'll show those results in a little bit and then we're gonna see what the red jackets. Okay, I think we got it. Last call. Okay, create the right work environment, 45%. Interesting, I think that's about in line with what our SJPs, our Red Jacket Super Panelists said as well. Um, interestingly enough, we had a couple of folks ans answer about the supply chain where none of you all identified that as one of the most challenging things that you're gonna have to deal with. So I'm gonna go down the line and, uh, and ask you to, um, Al, I'm gonna ask you to talk about why you answered the way you answered. Um, I'm gonna pick on you first. Sure, um, I say customer relationships forever. Um, you know, we're a virtual company. So, you know, keeping our relationships, you know, from manufacturing, CRO relationships, and, you know, we, we can't do what we do without our business partners. So to me, it's peculiar to, to my situation, you know, so maintaining, you know, customer or supplier relationships is critical to me. Um, and particularly with supply chain and, you know, uh, to be able to do clinicals, we just don't do them ourselves. Excellent. And Sharon, I'm going to pick on you next. And you said um, creating the right work environment. Why do you think that's going to be one of your biggest challenges going forward? Um, you know, Taryn, I think it's because we've gotten through this for the last six months. And now we can sort of safely say that some form of remote working is here to stay. And what we need is a system. I mean, everyone has done their best. And certainly in our company, people have shown up and done amazing things, but there's so many interfaces and interdependencies. The, the bar is going to be raised now, um, you know, both from a human standpoint and a technological standpoint. I mean, to really maximize the potential of remote working, we're going to need, you know, different technologies, tools for collaboration, creativity tools, productivity tools. Um, resources and policies and practices and processes that, you know, because we're in a new system now and rules and norms, things that we're going to need to pr 
preserve and enhance our culture and values. So I think no one really has the answer. We're all trying to figure it out up to this point, but the key is really gonna be going forward to experiment and learn and be really flexible because we all know while thing, many things can look good on paper and um, dreams are great, the reality can be very different. Excellent, couldn't agree with you more. Um, Amir Kalali, you said business development, and I'd like to know why. Well, actually, I have two up because I've only got two hands, right? I, I would have put all five up if I could, if I had five hands. So what I would say is the question really should be what isn't going to be especially challenging, frankly, right? So all of it. put all in a survey. Right. So, so I think everything is, to me, I mean, the question is really about, you know, from a leadership perspective, I think a couple of things. First of all, there's an uncertain future more than ever, right? So really trying to predict that uncertain future. And the other one, as, as a, one of the physicians on the group, I, I'd be remiss not to mention, I think really not underestimating the emotional impact, not just on our employees, on our partners, on our patients. So I think that's going to have an impact on all sorts of relationships, projects, everything. So I think that's the kinds of things I think about. Excellent. And Don, I'm going to turn to you next. And you agree with Sharon, it's about creating that right work environment and nurturing that employee base. I do, and uh, to state the obvious, the world is completely upside down today. Uh, in a flash, what we have always done and how we have done it are no longer relevant. And when we think about what this means to our organization, the only thing that is constant is why, why we do what we do. When an organization loses sight of the why, the most powerful motivator is gone. So the energy dissipates when that happens. Leaders must be constant reminders today of the why, zealots for their business purpose. The phrasing the bar is purposeful energy as we all think of it. There are ample reasons to be down, 190,000 deaths, fight for equal justice, failing economy, and for our industry, the marginalization of science by political forces. Additionally, our organizations have people who are afraid, lonely, uncertain about their future. And so all of that causes a sense of losing hope. Leaders must be an example of the courage that sets the way we can lead our organizations and our people uh, to the next confirmation of the why our companies do what they do. Excellent, thank you. Cameron Durant, good to see you. And I'm gonna pick on you next. Um, so you also chose uh, creating the right work environment. So what are you doing at Humanogen? Uh, well, we're doing a lot. Um, but let me perhaps respond with the macro perspective and then bring it down to the individual and why I chose creating uh, the, the work environment as the focus. So this is the worst healthcare crisis that humanity has had to face in centuries. In some ways, this means that we have to press the reset button on humanity, not just our industry, but on so many other things, the way we do those things and our expectations. So then in the context of the work environment, if you have a philosophy, which I do, and I imagine a number of people uh, in this audience do, that in adversity is sometimes the greatest opportunity. And seeing opportunity where others might shy away, perhaps uh, retreat, go into fear, means that for the individual, you can only go further to the extent that you have visited deeper internally with yourself and who you are. Uh, and I think having that kind of um, philosophy, creating safety around people's ability to express their concerns, their fears, as well as encouraging people to step beyond. And that's what I mean about you, you can only go further if you've really um, 
visited deeply internally to confront who you are and what blockers may be there and may have been there for a long, long time, if not your entire life. And that's where there's the real opportunity. Awesome. Um, I'm Al, you, you chose business development. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you for what you have put together here. This is amazing. So, and you look so fresh after like now 19 <laughs> or 20 years, I mean, uh, hours. But the reason, number one, I would agree with Amir that if I had a choice, I would have said three out of four <laughs> of the responses. However, given that I had to select one, I selected uh, business development specifically for our company. And let me tell you why that was really important for us. So that is really important for us. So first of all, I thought about control and manage. What can I control and what can I manage more? And I felt that I could control and manage our work environment a little bit more because I can make lots of decisions. It's on me. The second one was our current clients. We have a very good relationship with them and they know us, we know them, we are all together. So I think that it's not a huge issue. We can manage it. Along with that organic business development and growth we can because our clients like that and they give us new work. So this is great. That kind of left with the other business development where we don't know people. They don't know us, we don't know them, our potential clients, future clients. When I start looking at that or thinking about it, chemistry is one of the most important thing that everyone talks about. That's how we get, you know, they talk about, you know, everyone would say that, or majority of the potential clients would say that chemistry is extremely important. And when they weigh it in terms of the decision making, it is 50 to 60% of the weight that they give for chemistry that turns into trust, right? So when as a mid-sized agency that we are, it's extremely difficult to develop that chemistry through Zoom <laughs> or <laughs> communicate. It's very difficult. Networking is very difficult. It's very difficult for them to know that we get them and that hopefully they get us. It's very di difficult to talk and show our value of service, our um, can-do attitude, our team and how much they can bring, how well our team may work together and potentially how well our team can work well with their team or potential customers together. And, um, you know, when I started looking at all those things, you know, or, or for example, even the look and feel of our office and welcoming of the office that our other staff members can do. There are a lot of cultural things, there are a lot of things that really bring that chemistry together or develop that chemistry. And I feel that it is extremely difficult for our size company to do that in this environment going forward. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Andrea, hi. Um, you chose creating the, work, the right work environment as well. So why is that important to you at Microsoft? I think a lot of people hit on, on the part of working with customers and patients and how to really connect with them virtually. I'll also talk, I, I think I'll pivot a little bit more to say, even with my team and the employees in the organization, right? We have physically changed the way we work. And I used to say, you know, you know, with all travel and everything else, it was crazy. It's like every working moment, is, people have now the ability to be online and working. And I feel like it's crazy, but we're actually working more. So how do you keep, you know, the team and the people focused? At the same time, people's lives have been turned upside down doing um, teaching their kids at home, trying to run a business, et cetera. So we've actually put in place um, a chief caring officer on our team. Um, to really try to keep connecting on the personal side. And we set up, my team has been virtual, you know, our company is, is pretty virtual, um, but we set up things like, you know, coffee talk and water cooler, where you come in, you're not allowed, not allowed to discuss anything about the business, right? How are you doing? What's happening in your family? What are you struggling with? So really the personal side of keeping the employees together and really seeing both their personal 
lives and work lives blended and making more room for that person virtually. Excellent. And I have not heard about a chief caring officer before, so that's a new one. Um, Dave, good to see you. I saw you this morning at 7.30. You look great. We started the day together, didn't we? <laughs> we started the day together. Um, you said maintaining customer relationships is one of your biggest challenges. Tell us why. So there's been a lot of compelling arguments uh, so far, but I would say everything starts with the customer. Everything. Uh, creating the right work environment, protecting the supply chain, business development, they're all critical challenges. But when our customers are struggling, experiencing uncertainty, chaos, and fear, we've got to put our best people and our best efforts towards customer relationships. Um, for example, the, the, the traditional HCP workflow is up for grabs. Physicians don't know where their practices will land. Will it be 50% telehealth, 25% telehealth? Will telehealth be reimbursed for the long term? I mean, these are questions that threaten the financial livelihood for many doctors in the middle of a, of a period of extraordinary clinical stress. And, and patients, patients are, are just now beginning to feel comfortable about coming back to see their PCP, but studies are starting to come out about the cost of the long tail of delayed diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Starting patients on a new therapy, onboarding patients to a biologic, providing virtual support for compliance. These are all dramatic changes to how we deliver care, not only here in the US, but around the world. So I truly believe that, that um, we've got to rip up the old HCP workflow and the old patient journey maps that we painstakingly built over the last couple of years and start again. Reintroduce ourselves to our customers, um, understand what they value now on an individual basis, and deliver that value as simply and as quickly as possible. I think that represents the biggest test for the industry. Uh, if, if we fail at that, um, we'll slide back down to the bottom of the industry reputation ledger. But if we recommit to our customer relationships, then we've got a shot at revitalizing trust and confidence as an industry. So that's why I would argue for maintaining customer relationships is the biggest test for our industry today. Excellent. Thank you. And you're right, just as we're starting to climb back up. So, uh, Lee Ram, nice to see you. Um, and you chose creating the right work environment, which was no surprise to me. But why don't you tell everybody why? Well, hi, everyone. And thanks, Taryn. And let me add to the chorus. Kudos to you uh, and the team on this awesome uh, marathon event. I I'll start by saying everybody with us today is lucky. We're all open for business. And although this is certainly not business as usual, we're lucky enough to be working in an incredibly resilient industry. And at times like these enable leaders to demonstrate their principles in action. And I would argue that leadership at all times is fundamentally about people and principles. In our case, that's uh, our highest order principle for 23 years has really been that people first philosophy. So uh, we started working from home late in February. We guaranteed job security. Uh, we also emotional security. And then beyond explicitly committing to uh, keeping our team whole and cohesive. The first stage was really about safety and adapting practices. In some cases, uh, we're finding that a purely virtual uh, form can improve effectiveness. Uh, now, this might sound uh, weird, uh, but although we are further apart, it, it feels like we're simultaneously also closer together. Uh, and, and that's, I think, because we, we start conversations with, with talking about intimate home life and uh, providing community support and support and, and refactoring supporting roles uh, like our mojo team or talent experience team we have many functions support functions like our facilities or even our live experiences or travel experiences team. Now, these are individuals whose pre-pandemic responsibilities are, are, are simply not necessary today but we know that these are people that want to contribute and so we've been able to really learn that we have people with a master's in education that instead of work training travel are now able to provide tutoring and support the Clickster's kids. So the right work environment to maximize creativity as we look ahead, uh, we find that actually looking backwards is instructive because uh, perhaps, uh, I, I think this might be counterintuitive, but, but the, the increased effort that is required these days, and when you add to that the community responsibility, the philanthropic efforts, these have actually been a galvanizing force. And, and I think the clear and concise asynchronous communication, some of the tools, some of the daily calls, these are things that will persist. And of course, as we think about adapting to digital delivery for everything for our clients, I think this is a time for all of us to step up. Relationships are built uh, in tough times. It's so easy to manage when things are smooth, 
So our, our advice is really for everyone to play the long game, invest in automation, revisit all the playbooks as has already been said. But as you digitize all of these touch points, critically think about the, the changing preferences of these stakeholders. And, and I guess the key takeaway for us is culture, 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 and, and recognizing that every year brings challenges. So this is really about how an organization rises to those opportunities, which is why we don't think of 2020 as the year of pause. We really think of 2020 as a year of possibility. I love that. I think this is the opportunity to, it's, it's our opportunity to seize the opportunity that's been given to us and create those silver linings. So excellent. And Julie, I'm going to end with you and you talk to us about business development. Sure. Um, and I know you already have a winning culture because we just talked about that. Thanks, Taryn. Um, I think all of these options are related, right? Um, but when I think of the industry and I think of my own company, I think business development is primarily driven through collaborations. And our industry starts with business development. All of the products we, del we deliver to ultimately to patients is driven through business development and the collaboration that goes along with BD. I think in order to drive business development, it's all about um, developing deep, trusting relationships. Um, and it's just more difficult when you're sitting in a virtual world. That electronic um, screen time does not let you get down deep and really get to know a person, get to know a partner where you're going to now put two companies together or two individuals together to be able to get to a better business outcome. You know, typically you're used to getting on airplanes and bringing teams together and then breaking bread together, having a drink maybe, learning not only about a company's capability or the other party's capabilities, but getting to know them as people. When trust develops, business development starts to happen and it really goes forward. So in this new world, I think we all have to challenge each other. How do we develop that relationship, that trust that drives BD? I think it's gonna take more touch points. It's gonna take longer periods of time, but I know with this amazing group of leaders, we, we can make it happen. I agree. And, you know, there was no wrong answer to this question. I was really pressure testing you all to explore some of these different options and ways that we're going to have to look at business going forward. So thank you for your variety of responses. And thank you for like your thoughtful responses. I think there's a lot of um, great information in here that the audience can unpack and really apply to their own operations. So Thank you. Um, and by the way, can I just tell you how awesome you all look in your red jackets? I don't think I said that at the beginning. It's really, it's fantastic. Um, Dan, we're ready for poll question number two. Okay, so we'd like to know which leadership skill have you had to rely on the most while leading your organization during the pandemic? Okay, I'm gonna say last call and close the poll. Let's share the results. Empathy, number one, pretty good lead. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's something that we've been hearing throughout um, the day as well through our 24 hours of talking with, oh, I'm sorry, Red Jackets, I forgot, show your, show your responses. Excellent, and so we do have a variety of folks um, of answers, and empathy is certainly one of the top ones uh, with you all as well as with uh, the folks that we've been engaging with all day. Um, you know. It's interesting to me that I didn't see team building as um, one of the things that you all are focusing on right now, um, but there's so many other things to focus on, so I can see why that would not rise to the top. Um, Sharon Callahan, I'm gonna pick on you first to talk about why empathy is an important um, skill, or has been an important skill for you over the last several months. Sure, and I really think it builds on the last question, you know, what Don and Cameron and Julie and especially what Andrea said, we all have to uh, have a chief caring officer and maybe we all have to think of ourselves as chief caring officers. Especially, you know, leadership and uncertainty requires an essential skill. It's making yourself available 
and really vulnerable enough to feel what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And that's really what leading with empathy is. Um, you know, for me, the scale of this pandemic has made empathy a little easier because we're all going through the same thing. But I'm going to be really honest and say sometimes it can also be really numbing. Um, you know, it's hard to be present all the time, especially on this screen all day long. It really requires a level of energy and intention that I don't think I've ever experienced in my career. And, you know, at the same time, there's kind of a leveling of what's happening between people. I'll tell you a little story. I was recently talking to a new client who is a very high powered woman. She always shows up perfectly and is very much in control. And she was going on and off the camera and shushing her little daughter who kept showing up in the background. And, you know, I just stopped the meeting and asked her if we'd better if we talked that night after her daughter went to bed. And, you know, I just said, it looks like you have your hands full and my kids are older and I don't have the same pressures. That's, you know, I think Julie, what you were talking about, creating trust, creating mutual common ground. And it's really gonna be what's required going forward as we're working this way. Someone, you just need someone to say that they understand what you're going through. And we're all just people and maybe this pandemic is bringing that into sharper focus for all of us. Because the truth is we've all been suffering a lot of burdens, but we've also been receiving some amazing and unforeseen gifts. Um, I, for me, it's been a defining time in my journey and I feel connected to people because we have this shared global experience of change and of struggling through all the emotions that come with it. So I am looking forward to the world becoming a kinder and more understanding place. And I, I really hope we don't let all of the good things that we're getting from this go. Amen, sister. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna get you into the conversation now. You talked about agile innovation. So talk to us because Part of all of this is the ability to pivot. So talk about agile, how you're being agile. Yeah, I guess, Taryn, you know, talking about agile, I can't think of a more perfect example of agile than what you've created here today um, with this, right? You've always put on an incredible show and this year is no different. And I think part of um, being agile is in many ways letting go and moving forward. And I think even in our preparation for this, when we had some of the panelists and we had discussions with you, there was no discussion of what last year looked like or the year before it looked like. It was, this is the set of circumstances that we have and let's push forward and make the best of it. And I can think of a couple of you know, real world examples, even from a team meeting, I think we touched on a lot of those. The team here at Real Endpoints immediately pivoted to digital. We were getting, having people be able to work at 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. to Sharon's point because they had two working parents and two little kids and watching them. And, and we understood that we were not going to hear from them between nine and six if they, if they couldn't make it. Um, at an industry level, um, you know, one of the first things we saw here, we do a lot of work in the patient services um, area and one of the first impacts was really this affordability issue of drugs on the part of patients and we got so many calls within the first couple of weeks not about what is going to be the impact on my company or my sales or my market share but how are we going to figure out a way to get our drug to patients in an affordable way there was never a question of this is what it looked like this is what our supply chain looked like it was really focused on the patient and how to get a product to them in an affordable way, really agile. And then finally, on, on sort of a broader company side, um, and this idea of letting go, I, I actually sit on the, the board of uh, two companies, Lundbeck and Asperian, that both got approvals in February and March. And okay. imagine working on something for 10 years um, at Asperian to bring a brand new product to market or spend $2 billion on an acquisition, get the approval, and then all of a sudden, every plan completely blew up. And I, I've never seen such agility from teams like that, where again, it was a complete letting go of all the plans, including a massive 500 person um, launch meeting um, that nobody could obviously go to. And those teams just continue to just march forward and figure out 
virtual detailing, advisory boards in a different way, getting data in a different way, medical science liaisons, and they never did come back to the board at all and say, well, this is, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, but this is what we're doing moving forward. So, so in my mind, the, the agility piece, again, as completely evidenced by what we're all doing here right now, uh, tonight at, at close to eight o'clock at, at night is, is just such a critical part of, of moving forward through this. Well, well, thank you for that. And I have to say, while I'm the face of this, uh, this is really the vision of Merrill Walsh. And there is a complete exhausted team behind me who's been working on it tirelessly for the last, I don't know, six weeks or so. So it's really the, the credit goes to them. Um, you know, Wendy, I'm going to drag you into the conversation now, and we're going to talk about why you chose empathy. Yeah, well, first of all, I hope your team is, uh, was paying attention to the cocktails. Um, <laughs> why did you end up one? <laughs> <laughs> or at least in a, in a little bit, right, as, we, uh, as, we, as you go into the home stretch. And what a fantastic um, example uh, you've provided for pivoting and, uh, and making this really effective. So for me, um, we um, uh, have um, started a relatively new company. I'm building a global company here in the middle of COVID. Uh, doing uh, global managed access. Half my staff is in Europe. Um, and uh, so we're on Zoom calls. Everybody's in a different time zone. And I, uh, one of the things I love, Andrea, the idea of the chief caring officer, that's, we don't have one of those, but we really have come to understand that um, when in America we get up and say, okay, I'm ready to go. Some of the people in Europe are going, oh my goodness, I am at the end of my day. And so we sort of have to take a breath and go, okay, how's everybody doing before we sort of get into business because people are at different rhythms. Also, um, I've also discovered that um, our European people speak a different language. I'm talking about the ones in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other English? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing um, just all the conversations that we're having um, in terms of building trust and, and actually what you mentioned before of team building um, because that's really what we're doing. I mean, we're talking about empathy, but I think empathy is critical one to think about where is everybody coming from in this incredibly challenging but also this opportunity for all of us to be in it together um, as Sharon was talking about um, uh, because of the unique challenges um, that everyone is having and really being careful about that and thinking about it and giving people the space to have sort of water cooler conversations and to connect and to build teams, in our case, globally, and to really listen, especially when someone, like I said, is speaking a different language, which we didn't think they were, and yet a lot of words have very specific meanings, even if it sounds like you know, you're speaking, you're saying the same thing. So uh, I think uh, that's, that's uh, it's just critical. Empathy is, is, is uh, so important, and I also am optimistic, I think, as uh, Sharon said, that that this is something that we can take forward um, into all of our interactions moving forward because as we have more and more diverse workplaces, it's not just the language like that, it's like everybody coming from a different place, you don't know what they're dealing with. I mean, it's, it's right in front of our face this year, but we never know what everybody's dealing with. Um, and so I think it's always important to be careful and thoughtful um, about thinking about um, where to meet people where they are and to think about how you're going to work together to solve these complex challenges that we're faced with. Absolutely. And, and Wendy, I've told you more than once, words matter. So, right. Um, uh, you know, Julie, I'm going to turn to you again for you, you answered collaboration. And I think that goes back to your previous answer about business development. So if you want to just give us a little bit more about that. And sure. I, I think Sharon, Jeff, Wendy, totally in alignment with, with empathy, empathy and agility. I think over the last six months, four or six months, I find myself leaning more, more on collaboration skills. And I think it's coming from a place of recognizing that more than ever, we're operating in an isolated environment. We have all those unplanned distractions more than ever before. And as we sit on the webinars and we're asked to collaborate, which is really where you put individuals together and you're looking for a common purpose to achieve some kind of business benefit, the technologies now are helping us extend participation to an ever greater number of people. But as we have more and more people sitting 
in this collaboration space, um, as the team size increases, the tendency to collaborate can naturally decrease if we don't have the right conditions. So as a leader and with my leadership team, I think it's all about championing collaboration, executive support first, then making sure we're investing in the social environment around the meetings we're having. We're modeling collaborative behavior, coaching spontaneously. And then I think you have to continually look and challenge leaders to be um, both relationship skill based as well as task. Um, and when we do that, I think we can still collaborate in a healthy um, environment and push the results forward. So collaboration for me has been a big thing that I've been looking at, leaning on. That's awesome. That was one of the, of the themes that really resonated today throughout all of our conversations. Um, Liram, you ta also talked about empathy. Um, so tell us why this is now a skill that is even more important today than ever. So I think empathy, vulnerability, communication, and, and listening uh, are all incredibly important skills all the time, but especially now. And, and I think optimism too. Optimism can, it can exist simultaneously with stress, anxiety, and the challenges and abundance of which are obviously being generated by these unique times. Uh, but probably the most non-obvious learning for us was the degree to which uh, some of these things are upstream, uh, for example, hiring practices. Uh, so we filter our hiring for individuals to demonstrate kindness. That, that's actually one of our highest order optimism, empathy, adaptiveness, lovability, inclusiveness. So that helps culture, but it actually creates a highly integrated team with, with people that have good chemistry and, and, and that camaraderie is awesome. But perhaps a side effect of that uh, is that our team is very much longing to get back together. And we're sensitive to, to, to that because at the same time, most of the people we interview, a lot of the uh, clients we speak with, we hear the opposite. For, for a lot of people, they're, they're, they're finding that uh, uh, this is great. And, and so I think that's probably arising from where a person's starting point is. If they're pre-pandemic, in other words, if their pre-pandemic uh, uh, position was that they love their culture, uh, then they probably miss the office now. But, but if they didn't, this is probably a wholesale improvement. And then there's opportunities to really lean in. So for us, I think more than anything, this reinforced uh, some of the investments in committing to maintaining a people first culture. Um, and, and in terms of advice, I'd say if that's not your reality or if you have individuals that don't feel that way, then listening to those individuals who are not excited about returning back may actually be a very insightful place to start. But like I said, for us, this has been very validating and energizing and and of course, we're hiring, so uh, that, uh, that helps. <laughs> That's excellent. Shameless, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's correct. Um, you know, Michelle, I'm going to ask you to continue to lean into empathy. Um, and I know that we've had a lot of talk about it, but you have some very specific uh, things you want to tell us. Yeah, thank you. And I really have enjoyed this immensely. I'm like taking notes as you're all talking, just so you know. I'm like, this is amazing, all these great ideas. But, um, you know, I picked empathy because I think empathy is where it all starts. And I think I've learned a lot about when you are an empathetic leader, what that other values that that can bring to an organization. So, you know, early on, I think we all went through the same thing, using technology to connect us all, trying to figure out how we could read each other's you know, feelings over Zoom or over WebEx, trying to really understand how somebody was feeling and the experience that they were going through. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, really helped us in our organization is the fact that we really did try to understand where people were at and meet them where they were at. Whether it was dealing with homeschooling, I mean, uh, Liram, you probably, and, and Sharon, I'm sure you both can uh, totally appreciate our workforces are a lot of people with children at home, the majority of the people that work in our types of businesses. And um, really understanding where they were at, what they were dealing with, what strategies that we could bring forward to them to help them be successful in you know, achieving their work with customers and with clients as long as well as they were, you know, thinking about how they could support their children. And I think the thing that I, I loved is because we did a, we called it a listening tour. We spent like the first month really listening to everyone in every key role in the organization, understanding what was getting in the way 
or what kinds of things they would like to see us do. And I think we uh, built a lot of flexibility into how we got work done. And I think the thing that amazed me the most is that, you know, here we are, a bunch of us senior leaders, and it's really important that, you know, we support um, the organization and help the organization stay, stay inspired and focused. But the thing that I was totally amazed by was the inspiration of the human spirit of the people on our teams. The amount of help that they gave each other, right? Okay, you have a client meeting at three, but I know that you know, you're in charge of like the kids after school today. So brief me on what you have to do and I'm gonna do it for you. The volunteerism and the selflessness that I saw on the teams of people that, that work here at Cineos Health was so inspiring to me. And I think that started because of that listening tour, that empathy to try to truly understand where people were at. Giving people flexibility to volunteer. I mean, you know, we're a CRO as well as a commercial organization. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of, you know, physicians on staff and they wanted to treat patients. They wanted to be in the front lines of, of helping, um, you know, patients with COVID. We had employees in, in London that wanted to volunteer to actually do the, the COVID testing because, and you know, we opened up our parking lot of our corporate headquarters in London to, to, to funnel through um, COVID testing. And we had to figure out how do you balance your biz, how do you balance the business needs that you have with a really not forgetting why we're in this business, which is to really ensure that patients get the best care and they get the best medicines. And you know, balancing those two very important you know, goals that we all have. And, and I think it started with, with empathy. You know, the thing that I'm, I'm really enjoying now is um, the amount of feedback I'm getting about the innovative things that people are doing. And um, I just saw an email go out from one of our agencies that they actually have, all the senior leaders have signed up for an hour a day that they're going to virtually watch people's children and teach them something. So I have somebody what? teaching yoga, I have somebody that uh, actually uh, speaks, I have people who speak Spanish, French, and Italian. So we have an Italian hour, we have a Spanish hour, so the kids can you know, focus on their language. It, it's just amazing what you can do when you truly listen to folks. And so I think that leading with empathy unlocks all the other value that we've been talking about, right? So that, that's uh, you know, what I wanted to share with everybody today. So thanks for asking, Karen. You're welcome, Michelle, that's a great tip. I'm going to turn to Amir and see if he's grown two more hands to see if he can hold up four placards this time. Four of them, yeah. For this one, I don't need to. I'd like to uh, build on what Michelle was saying, and that's wonderful, Michelle, what you shared with us around uh, what the company's been up to. Um, I think, as Michelle said, really, you've got to start with empathy. So if you look at the other items, team building, collaboration, innovation, none of those can really exist without a foundation of empathy, whether it's for your team members, for partners, for collaboration, or thinking about innovation. So that's why I chose empathy, because I think it's at the core of all these things. So that's why I would say it's just a foundation. All of them are important, but as a shrink, I have to say empathy wins. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you know, Cameron, I'm gonna turn to you. You also chose, uh, like Jeff did, agile innovation. And you're working in a company right now that has to be able to pivot to meet some of the demands that you're facing. So. Um, tell us why you chose uh, Agile Innovation. Well, I am reserving the right to change my mind because uh, with this conversation, I think I'm with empathy now. I'm going to be empathic with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I think all of them are at play. Uh, and actually, just to come back to empathy for a moment, the comment I remember from almost 30 years ago from my first boss in the industry and what he said was never assume that somebody else's life is any less complex than yours and it's obviously stuck with me uh, all these years and he didn't use the word empathy but that's clearly uh, one of the foundation stones of uh, displaying empathetic leadership. So then getting to agile innovation. So yes, we pivoted. We appear to pivot, pivot, and then pivot a little more. Um, so having now been in uh, the role that I have been for five years, uh, we've come through many different adventures. Um, and I think 
rather than um, ask why is this happening to us, um, kind of take a mindset of don't ask for things to be easier. Ask of yourself to be better. Mm. Um, things won't be easy. Well, you may be fortunate and uh, they wind up being easier than for many other people, but often that's just the veneer. Everyone has problems. And once you've solved one problem, you often find yourself on the friend end of another one that uh, you have to deal with. That's the nature of life. So uh, we kind of treat innovation as try stuff without fear. Right, we are certainly in a situation in a company which has far less resource than any of the big guys, far fewer people. Um, what we have that you can't really buy is tenacity, creativity, enthusiasm, energy, and a complete refusal to give up or to be afraid of anyone or anything. And that just naturally breeds the uh, ability to try stuff. Right. You know, we, we've heard the, the term fail fast, fail early, and fail inexpensively. Uh, we prefer not to fail. We prefer to re-engineer and make it better the next time. I like that. That's awesome. Uh, Dave, again, you know, we're, we're really talking about empathetic leadership and uh, that was your choice as well. So again, I wasn't surprised when I saw that was your response, but why don't you delve into a little bit of that for us? Well, first, let me say thank you, Cameron. I've got at least two quotable quotes from you for this evening that I've written down. Okay, so you're right, Taryn. Originally, I joined the majority opinion and voted for empathy, but since empathy is feeling well cared for, I'm feeling some sympathy for team building, which seems awesome. to have been kicked to the curb. Um, first of all, fortunately, a, a closer look is a fully agile shop. So, so picking up on March 13 and going home wasn't a big deal in terms of productivity. Our daily stands just moved to Zoom and Jira remains our, our virtual scrum board. But I have had to spend a lot more time and attention on team building, especially as we continue to hire and onboard new staff in this new world. Um, we've probably recruited, interviewed, hired, onboarded over 35 new staff since March 13, all virtually. So they've never seen our office and we've never seen them face to face. Um, so there has to be a real focus on maintaining our culture, reinforcing our values, um, providing space for authentic conversations, for engagement. Um, because if we're not careful, it'd be too easy for there to be a bifurcation between the pre-COVID staff and the post-COVID staff. The pre-COVID staff, they all remember what it's like to hang out together and everything is, is sort of assumed and we give each other the benefit of the doubt. But the post-COVID folks, well, we're, you know, we don't really, we haven't seen them face to face. So we have to create lots of opportunities, um, whether it's a virtual beer o'clock on Friday afternoons or company-wide conversations on diversity, equity, inclusion, and women in leadership, or our weekly all-company coffee talk. Uh, these are all opportunities to over-communicate up and down and across the company. Um, I schedule one-on-one -on -one time with every new employee after two or three months to check in, but mostly just to give them permission to be themselves, to engage and ask questions, to challenge us, uh, to jump in and contribute to their team. Um, it, it, it reminds me a bit of one of our core values at Closer Look is we call it play for the team. And part of the definition of this core value is you come with batteries included. <laughs> but when we're all doing this virtually week after week, encouraging our clients, solving their problems, helping them to thrive and evolve quickly, well, everybody needs their batteries recharged at some point. Um, so that's where I and my management team come in. If we take care of our people, our teams, they'll take care of our clients. And that's what I and my management team take very, very seriously. Excellent. Well, thank you for caring enough to address team building. I do appreciate that. Um, Don, you chose collaboration. Um, so let's talk about 
why this is important for you right now in your organization. Well, following my colleagues on this panel and the wonderful thoughts they've shared, there's little more I can add. I, I chose collaboration. I could have chosen any of the four. In fact, I think all four are traits of leaders. Um, and one can argue one proportion in one situation. I chose collaboration though, because the, the mental picture we have of collaboration are people working together in some way. But what was missed in, I think, a more classical sense that we're seeing now in the COVID era is collaboration of spirit. Yeah. And that, that collaboration, you know, a leader can touch a handful of people. I can, I can put policies and practices that are themselves uh, certainly indications of my nature of, 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 of being empathetic. The problem, though, is how one touches thousands of people spread throughout the world. And I have been absolutely amazed at the stories of our people without, without reason, without being advised to do so. We'll do things like send dinner to a colleague's house because they know that she's busy um, taking care of her kids and tutoring them in the evening and she's got a project to do. And if they send dinner, it saves her the trouble of cooking so that she can spend more time with the children. And there's anecdotes and stories of that that are collaboration of the highest kind. They're not doing the work or, or let's put our heads together to get something accomplished. They're putting the spirit and souls together so that we can hold an organization together. So I choose to think of collaboration while all four are perfectly reasonable and leaders traits. Collaboration in this era feels different to me. It feels something in the heart and soul as this, as our people come together. And I think it's remarkable. Excellent, Don, thank you so much. Um, and I'll, you also chose empathy. So we're gonna lean a little bit more into that. Okay, thank you, Karen. <clears throat> yes, I did. Uh, you know, it'd be kind of interesting if you had asked this question one to two years ago, what would the response be? And exactly. I would think that empathy would not be as high as it is right now. So I pretty much started thinking about, uh, you know, Harvard Business Review and what you talked about with the emotional operating system. And there is like a huge overload on that operating system. And if you think about why it is, you know, it's an interesting, in the beginning of this year or last year, when we talked about disruptive companies, technologies, we said, yeah, that's going to happen. It'll take a while. Even Amazon didn't do what COVID has done to us in like one month. <laughs> right. So that on, you know, the whole psychological overload in terms of how quickly it hit us, we don't even know how long it's going to hit us. I remember when we closed our office, it was initially, oh, we'll be back in maybe two weeks. Then it was one month. Then it is June. Now it is January, but we don't know. And when you start looking at all those things and the uncertainty in terms of the disruption, the, the land now, one day we have hope for vaccine, the next day, whoops, there's an adverse event. There's so many things are happening that are outside of our control that I feel that as if I want to be a good leader in my organization, I have to show that empathy. If I don't show that empathy, nothing is going to happen right now. Then the team will build, build because they know that we care. And we, and, and what, we did a survey with our employees in terms of, you know, what are their concerns? When do they want to come back, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting because yes, there are patterns and majority of them agree, but their small micro issues are different. Mm. One may be more, you know, the younger ones with parents, single parent with a child school opening or not opening, how am I going to manage it? I have a dog who is my, on my lap right now. Can I be uh, okay with Zoom? I mean, there are little, little things, but they become huge, big concerns from them. They're kind of built. And then there is that overload. The only way we think, at least for our company, is for our core members to be empathetic and understand different people and their uh, needs in terms of why they are worrying, 
what is worrying them and what can we help them with that one was in, in you know is, is really worried what happens if i get covid and i'm the person you know i have older parents who's going to take care of them or what happens if they get it because of me you know so or that i'm not worried about me because i'm younger and healthy nothing is going to happen but i'm worried about this one i'm worried about my children i'm worried i mean the list just goes on and on in terms of what their worries are if i show empathy hopefully they'll open up and, and my team of core members if we show sympathy you know empathy maybe they'll open up and we will be able to know what are the strengths in terms of togetherness for the team and where are the weak links in terms of that psychological overload that they have it's a psycho mental psychological it's the physical it, it's like you name it and there is an overload right and and again since it is different i think that we have to be first my, in our for our organization be empathetic understand that and then start building that team and collaboration also will come excellent and al i um I, you are last on our list here for this um section and one more lean into empathy yeah i'm just like michelle said earlier i'm just writing notes i mean the ideas and the the thoughts process are wonderful. I mean, um, I agree with the, the previous comment. I mean, you know, if you asked me this five years ago, this wouldn't be on probably my number one. Um, but, you know, I look back at March, you know, all the dawning things we went through to close our office and, you know, get people down. That, that looks easy. That looks easy. <laughs> that was a, getting a bunch of computers and Zoom to work now seems like child play. Uh, this is the hard work. This is really, really where it begins. And I just, I'm just gonna probably give a couple random things. Um, you know, we're, we're, we got our drug approved in February, which is relevant to a couple of comments earlier also. We're building in the middle of this. So I've, I've not met most of my employees face to face, you know, which is mind, mind blowing for me. I mean, uh, we've hired people that we probably might not meet for months, you know, which is in, in, incredible. Um, but one of the things that I, I just give you the practical side of this, I mean, we're Cineo's client, you know, where we're gonna use them as our sales force. And they, they have thousands of reps on the street. And, you know, then I just, you know, we're just saying, okay, what, 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 what are we learning? They have weekly focus groups with their reps and their field and doctors. And it's almost, for those of you who get the reports, it is almost unwielding. But I kept saying, what's the insight? And even at the rep level, the number one criteria they said higher on is, is empathy, which as a sales manager, <laughs> that would have been my number one. <laughs> you know, most of us don't hire empathetic reps. I, I didn't. I'll fess up. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, now, now I did. 68 of them. 68 of them. They better have empathy. You know, um, we, we screen for it. We look for it. We, 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 we hire for it. Look, I mean, they're, they're, you know, we're, going, we're talking to doctors who are barely paying their bills, you know, we're, you know that are just struggling to keep their staffs on, on the payroll. Boy, empathy is not a game. It's not a game. It's a job requirement at our company. Um, I do agree with the other comments that are made. A couple of folks that said, I mean, you get it, you get it. Like I've learned things about people that work for me for years that I've never known. Shame on me. But, you know, I, I, I know it's obvious, but I, I, I have tremendous respect for caregivers now, you know, whether they're parents or taking care of elderly parents. I mean, boy, I tell you, I've learned people, things that I just, just took for granted with my employees, just took for granted. I mean, um, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Um, shout out to everyone that's doing it. It's just not easy, even on a good day, much less this. But, I, you know, I guess show my empathetic side. I, I worry about our employees. I mean, we monitor vacations. I don't know. We, we, vacations are gone. They're gone. I don't know where I, people don't take time off. They don't. So I worry about their physical health. I mean, the COVID-10 is not a game. I, people aren't exercising. People aren't eating right. You know, people are staying up too much. You know, Tyron, Ty we're all worried about you. You better better get a good night's sleep after all this and, you know, get some sleep. Um, no, but, you know, I, I worry about our employees, their, their mental health and their physical health. You know, we give we do lots of crazy things. We give random days off. We just close the company on a random day. We don't even tell people we're doing. I just declare it. I'm like, done. We need a day off. <laughs> done. You know, um, we send gift cards to people randomly, you know, all employees. Just And we say, post some pictures of what you bought with it, you know, and, you know, they're, they're just wonderful. They're just wonderful. So, and we're trying, I don't, we don't have all the answers. And then for me with a Fitbit on my arm every day, I probably log more miles in the home office, walk in the halls and I don't do it. 
So the question the employees said, like, how are you going to walk the halls? I just show up in Zoom and people get scared and turn off their cameras and, you know, but I, no, that's a hard one for me. I, I don't know if everybody else feels that's a hard one. I mean, walking the halls is not easy <laughs> electronically, you know, especially when you know people are overloaded with these calls to begin with. And I, you know, what somebody else also mentioned, we like, I have coffee with every employee, every new employee, you know, coffee with Al. Yeah, I got a coffee cup in front of me. You know, I generally wear a t-shirt or something laid back and just, just talk to me. Just talk to me. So I don't, it's probably the number one skill with our sales force. The number one skill in our company right now. It's the glue that's holding together our company. It's the glue. It's just not a game. But I also let my hair down. I tell people how I'm struggling and, you know, my, my crazy life. And, you know, <laughs> so you kind of show, show that you're vulnerable too. I think, you know, it's not a game. I'm, I'm, I, I probably have learned a lot out of this experience just to be, more honest about what's going on in my life. And people seem to really get it. You, you, you open up, they open up, right? It is, you know, as I said, I mean, it's just, it's like somatic and maybe I feel better. Maybe I need a hug too. Um, so I think it's an important trait and it's not a game anymore. It's just probably, I hope it stays with us. I hope it stays in our DNA now. And if we open back up and return to some normalcy, I hope that's becomes a new normal empathy. I don't know that we can put the toothpaste back in the tube. I think we're we're past that and we're going to move forward. So, um, you know, this is a really inspiring conversation for me. I've got chills and I too am jotting down notes furiously. And certainly we don't run as large of organizations as you all do. Um, but, uh, you know, there are some great tips in here. If you're a leader right now and you need to know what your teams are doing, you need to know how your company, because they are the backbone of your organizations, your companies are, you know, a company is not a building, a company is your people. So um, kudos to all of you who are really working hard and, and leaning into all of these areas that need to be addressed um, to make sure that we do keep the lights on. Um, we're ready to go to question number three. And I promise, Mike Rea, I'm getting you in here. I know how late it is for you. So. We'd like to know how likely is it that these efforts that we've been talking about will break down barriers to improve global access to medicines in the next few years, which is pretty aggressive. All right, end the poll and share the results. About half the people think it's, it's pretty likely. That seems optimistic and that's good. And 30% very likely. <laughs> very likely, likely, and then not likely, yep. So Super Panel, show us your results. Okay. Ah, some cynics out there. That needs <laughs> me to no end. Um, so, um, Mike, I promised I'm going to get you in here. And thank you so much for staying up. I know it's probably, what, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning for you. So thanks for being with us and, you know, tapping into whatever energy drink you got going. Um, so you answered not likely. And please tell us why. Well, yeah, I feel this has been a nice panel so far and, uh, and a very positive one. So I, I feel slightly guilty wrestling a thorny issue with a negative comment. But um, it's real. Yeah, I think that uh, I think it's important for us to, uh, within this industry, lead, not just evangelize for it. And I think that uh, I think we should be calling out when our industry is, uh, is not living up to our hopes and ambitions for it. Um, and this is one, right? I think that I've seen this from the beginning, this pandemic is, I use this metaphor of if you're kind of journeying, journeying along a mountain road and this boulder drops, you know, some people will just wait for someone to come clear the boulder. Or some people will try and find a way over it or around it. And some people will say, well, should we have gone back and done something different? And I think there's a lot of people in pharma are waiting for the rock to go or, or they have found a way around it. You know, they're trying try to do business as usual, but business as unusual. Um, but I think this is an area where we haven't really seen the signals that we're going to try and improve access. I think if we were going to see a change in business approach to stop favoring the United States, to stop favoring high price medicines, to stop favoring rare diseases and orphan diseases, we would have seen it. And I think apart from the odd kind of bright spot, like, you know, Moderna saying that they were going to take longer to include a more diverse population in its vaccine study, that's a bright spot and we should be you know, enthusiastic uh, about welcoming that kind of behavior. Um, those kind of inclusion signals, you know, we've had that flag, not just from the pandemic, but also from movements like Black Lives Matter and other ways of addressing inequities within our healthcare system, you know, particularly within the United States, but I think that's shone a light on, on everything else. 
the challenge, I think, is that we have an industry that lives in 20 to 40 year cycles. You know, the money that comes in today is paying for the medicines that we might see in 20 to 30 to 40 years time. So we're still seeing uh, cancer. We're still seeing, you know, high price, rare disease, cell therapy, gene therapy being targeted as a development candidate. So we're not seeing pivots to, you know, global uh, health issues. Um, so then the question comes, well, are we looking at different financial models? And there's been this, you know, I don't know if we're, we've all called it out enough. We've seen this remarkable change in funding this year with the world's biggest ever X prize. You know, we've had governments basically saying, we're going to give you 3 billion, we're going to give you 5 billion if you can get us a vaccine on time. So like Peter Diamandis times, times a billion, right? You know, that kind of a, a, an approach. And companies have responded because there's a huge prize, uh, you know, at the end of that rainbow for the winners. And I think we've seen 130 companies um, kind of coming down the uh, coming down the turnpike, hoping to kind of uh, to, to get some of that to get some of that money. So we know that an X prize could yield results. Why don't we have an X prize for antimicrobial resistance? You know that kind of thing uh, has has always been interesting. And I think we've got that X prize because this has affected America this time. You know, before when it hasn't affected America, we haven't had the same d degree of you know where's the malaria X prize, where's the you know where's this you know the, the the other kind of vaccines that we've been calling out for for a while. So I think you know we as an industry, I think, have spent a lot of time saying, look, this is an opportunity to improve our reputation. And then we go, yes, I know remdesivir, yes, but uh, there's the you know maybe the next time the next drug that comes, they won't do that, and then we we keep stumbling over ourselves in this desire to do business as usual um but just during a pandemic so i think you know largely i feel that our reputation is unfair to us you know the people who work in the industry i think get into it to make a difference to people's lives to to, to do things that are meaningful i don't think that our reputation is fair to those people but i do think our industry and groups like pharma as a lobby group I think damage our reputation by PRing the, the, the hell out of, uh, you know, insignificant initiatives that don't really address these issues. We're being called out, we're being given huge issues to deal with, you know, the, the, the lack of, you know, even female inclusion in Alzheimer's studies, you know, the lack of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, you know, racial uh, groups and uh, socioeconomic groups in, in, in our studies the lack of focus on diseases that affect uh, uh, com countries outside the United States and the EU. We've been given those signals for a while. We've been given that as an opportunity. So I hope that we can move towards it, but I don't see any signals that are, you know, major companies are really doing anything other than throwing the company at a vaccine uh, this year and then hoping to go back to all of the kind of big, uh, you know, the things that are paying the bills in the, in, in the next short while. So, so it feels like a negative note in what's been a remarkably positive panel so far, but uh, uh, I, I answered not likely because I just don't see our companies responding that quickly to, um, to, 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 to the questions that we're asking. I don't think it's a pessimistic view. I think it's a realistic view. And I think that we are talking about some tough issues here in terms of, uh, what we're looking about global health is it's a serious business and you know it's not all unicorns and sunshine and while it is a very positive panel we do need to address where we are falling short so i, I think that's absolutely appropriate um and then i'm going to flip it over to craig who answered exactly opposite of you and he said very likely so let's let's get the counterpoint to that because that's what this is about so i i love that actually my answer on this was likely oh i'm sorry. likely Sorry. Keep in mind, likely for the listeners, that's a two on a scale of one to three. That's like when we call a grande a medium. <laughs> um, so, and the reason that I, I went down the middle on this is because I really have some mixed feelings on the topic. On the one hand, telehealth rules that are being broken down and improving access to care, improve access to diagnos diagnosis, and should be able to help improve access to get treatments into patients' hands. Even in the world of clinical trials, we see how decentralized trials were an important countermeasure for trial continuity, but at the same time are a great way for us to sustain access and removing barriers for patients to participate. But I also think about 
this part of the question that leaned into business models. And I think about the business models around a future that's hybrid because all of our futures are hybrid. We think about our kids in school, whether they're going back into school or they're, or they're online. We think about how we want to go back into restaurants, but you know what? Food delivery at home isn't terrible. Um, I've been exposed to Instacart. I want to go back to the supermarket, but I kind of like a hybrid future where I can stay home sometimes and go back sometimes. And this aspect about hybrid in our lives is, is, is an expectation that all of us as consumers and as patients are now bringing into this space going forward. And that's where business models that will be sustaining are going to meet the expectations of consumers and of patients. But when I, when I see the opening of the question lean into pandemics, I can't help but think how, at least where we are in the US, everyone but, but you, I think, Mike, um, for those of us in the US right now, we're facing two pandemics. We have a pandemic around COVID-19, and we have a pandemic around racial justice and racial intolerance. And I think that's exposing even more wounds that were already there around access. And that's probably what's bringing me down a little bit in terms of some of my optimism, because we're seeing dollars getting put out as a way to, to show that we recognize that these intolerances exist. But are we seeing sustaining change in terms of how we're engaging? And I'm just not sure. Fair enough. Um, and just for the record, Lee Ram is in Canada, so we do have two people left from the US. So just wanted to point that out. Um, and Nancy Dreyer, you also said not likely. So I'd love to hear why that is for you. Well, you have to uh, remember that I sit outside the pharma industry. I'm an epidemiologist working for a big company that tries to study safety and effectiveness and some economic models. But the uh, look at the problems we're going to face just in the country I live in, in the United States, over distribution of vaccines, right? It's, it's, these are big, complex problems that we're dealing with. I have long and good relationships with the WHO, but solving, um, solving all the world's issues so that we can get drugs distributed to the right place is the holy grail we're all going for. And I think, Craig, your, your comments on social justice, it's all tied together in this. It's uh, the reason that I was pessimistic is I don't see it as a near-term fix, a laudable goal, not, not a near-term fix. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm gonna turn to Jeff now. You said likely as well. So you're in that grande space with, uh, with Craig there. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I really appreciate Mike's uh, viewpoint because I, I think we were quite glasses half full as a, uh, um, a, a group of panelists. I feel like Mike brought us a little bit back down to earth. Um, I, I do agree with Craig that we may see a hybrid model. I think one of the reasons that we got in this mess to begin with is because as an industry, we have abandoned working together throughout the drug supply chain to figure out solutions to problems that we all need to solve. And we were going after ever more rare and orphan, smaller populations that we thought would be immune to price pressures being put on payers being put on us by payers and I think one of the big lessons that I learned going from large pharma after well over a decade into the rough and tumble world of retail pharmacy and then back into the gilded halls of a very very large payer one of the largest in the world I realized that there were just massive disconnects and as as a pharma industry we were and are solving problems that often other parts of the system are not asking us to solve um, because we again think that um, going after smaller rare and orphan diseases will will help us be immune from price pressure so i often see this as an opportunity and why i sort of said likely is you see it a little bit in some of the early things that have happened the sharing of data um, you know everybody going after um, you know one one particular uh, area to try to solve 
a, a problem, but, but I really urge us as an industry to connect at this point to the wider, broader healthcare delivery ecosystem, particularly here in the US where we've had this enormous consolidation and vertical integration of the largest payers, pharmacy benefit managers, aligning with insurance companies, aligning with drug distributors, aligning with specialty pharmacies, yet all of those pieces of the ecosystem are learning how to cooperate and work with each other for good or for bad. And pharma is still over here on the outside looking in, coming up with solutions that the rest of the group have not really asked for. And so I, I, I sort of put this as a, a likely in the hopes that it will sort of force the pharma industry to be more connected to solve the broader problems that the rest of the healthcare ecosystem is trying to go after. Excellent, Jeff, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is one of the questions that had the most variety in terms of your answers. So I love this point counterpoint and, uh, and, and thinking about what some of those nuances are. And Sharon, you, um, you, you answered optimistically, you said very likely. So let's hear from you in terms of why you think this is. Well, I just, maybe I wanna qualify and say it's a big question. And you know, healthcare has so many different areas. And I think for me, the innovation and resourcefulness I've seen um, in organizations that provide healthcare um, in the immediacy that they were able to respond to the crisis is very inspiring. Um, but, you know, it also has revealed vulnerabilities as, as some of the other panelists have pointed out, but also I think some transformative opportunities to improve healthcare. I mean, we've had to re-examine our understanding of how and where care can be provided, how and where professional boundaries are fixed versus flexible, um, which costs are truly fixed versus variable, and which resources are nice to have versus required. I think there's really three areas where we're going to be likely to see sustained change in the delivery of healthcare that will make everything better. And one that I think we've definitely seen are the traditional roles being challenged. It's shown us um, that the demand for service in many medical specialties declined, but while the overall demand for clinicians increased, and we've, been, we've seen doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals redeploy um, at, and, and be able to work um, not in such a silo. I think um, the shift, someone else mentioned the shift um, to remote and at-home care delivery. Um, I think it will be a hybrid, but we've observed a really rapid adoption of remote consultations and telehealth. Um, you know, you can see similar trends of adoption across digital therapies, remote monitoring, and some even at-home hospital procedures. So I think that's a shift that's going to stay with us. And, you know, another really exciting one has been the speed of decision making and execution. Hospitals, academic medical centers are places where decisions generally take weeks or months and they're now taking days and that's because of the necessity of it. Um, there's a lot more cross organizational collaboration again out of necess necessity and I, I've really seen in my own um, access to the healthcare system here in the US that that it's gotten better every time I've I've had to interact during this crisis. So I think the scale of change unleashed by the crisis is going to restructure at least the delivery of healthcare um, pretty pretty significantly. Excellent Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, I am just going to give a heads up to Barry. I apologize, you had wanted to answer this question and I don't think that came through to you on your script. So I'm going to let you gather your thoughts and I'll call on you last as we go through this um, section here. Uh, Don, you said likely. Um, so you're in the middle of the road with the other fellas. So. Well, I, no one wanted, I'm, I'm sure every one of us wanted to say very likely. And <laughs> so, there, there, and, and in that is the tension. But you know, I, I want to make two points. The first one, we speak about the pharma industry as though it was a monolith, uh, you know, some kind of a evil empire whose business model is getting in the way. The bench scientists I knew and know and grew up with could not be more dedicated people. They don't think about, they don't think about um, money 
Uh, they don't think about keeping their invention. They don't, they don't think that way. In fact, some of the most encouraging signs in the early moments of COVID was the collaboration that was occurring scientist to scientist as they shared their ideas and their concepts. So we should be careful. There are those in, in our industry that we're blessed to have. And these are the folks who are creating the cures and they're purposeful driven and they are remarkable people. Now let's get to the reality. Industry operates with the consent of the public, period. If it were not for the fact that we would allow the pharmaceutical industry to exist and we pay for FDA to review and approve drugs, the industry would not exist. It's one of the things that they feared today as price setting is now coming into focus. And so there's a political force here, irrespective of a business model and what shareholders are expecting or venture folks in the young uh, 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 emerging companies, there is still a consent of the public. There is a political process. Sometimes we have to put it in question, but I still think that's going to be a force that's going to be reckoned with. And if that's not enough, look for the positive moments of our history. Look for Roy Vagelos at Merck uh, when river blindness was an issue and completely donating those drugs to those who needed it. Think of some other examples we have in the rare diseases. So they're moments of encouragement. And I think if not the easy way, and pharma's lobbying isn't gonna help, if the consent of the American people through Congress and through lawmaking and the administration says, I'm changing the price of drugs. So keep a little optimism for what the consent of the public ultimately could do for this industry and any other. Excellent, Don, thank you so much. Uh, Wendy, you're next and I can't wait for you to dig into all the comments that had been said about rare disease, but you also said very likely I did say very likely because, um, I mean, but first of all, let me just say that I appreciate that this is maybe a very optimistic viewpoint. I guess I was thinking I want to be optimistic about it because there are huge challenges and uh, living sort of in the rare disease world where, you know, it affects 350 million people worldwide and all their families. It's not small. It's big. It's big. It's a huge number of people and their families who are affected. And I also, as you, I'm sure, I know you've heard me say this before, but I think that some of the examples that are, that happen, the collaboration between patient advocates, not just scientists, but patient advocates who are driving things forward and that kind of collaboration and innovation that's happening in these small areas when people are pushed to the end, um, that, uh, that I think will help us hopefully address some of the, um, the high, uh, because we are going to get pre we are getting pressure, and it's crazy how expensive it is. And maybe there's a model. I think we see a model in um, in some of these small rare diseases that could hopefully. This is my optimistic viewpoint, right? That it could hopefully be adopted in the future. Um, we see uh, ancestry uh, more and more playing into. Um, a part of that, and that's ancestry. Um, instead of talking about racial, right, we should really be thinking about ancestry because that's what genetics are. And you see that happening in um, sickle cell or in Frederick's ataxia or all these small things where the language is changing, the way where there's collaborative groups across these some of these small companies, uh, like like uh, Retrofin. You know, Eric Dubay, he's one of your Pharma Voice 100, really driving forward and. Um, and, uh, and 40 other collaborative companies thinking about how to get uh, more diversity in clinical trials happening at the rare disease end of the spectrum. So yeah, it's, they're not the big problems. Oh, and I did want to say one other thing and that really makes me feel a little more optimistic, and that is, um, I think some of the panelists have also said this, it's just looking at the amazing response that we've had um, at, to, to COVID. What can we do when we really put all our minds together to think about how do we solve a problem? And, um, and, and looking at, you know, the, 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 obviously the clinical trials are so critically important, but also the real world evidence when people are dying um, and thinking about how do, we, how do we balance that or how do we think in a different way to, to solve um, the problems of, of, and the mental health challenges and, and, uh, and all the things that are happening even all the discussion about empathy. I guess um, at the end of the day, maybe I just want to feel um, optimistic that these things will, uh, will help us, maybe not in the next five years, but in the next, say, 10 or 20 years, um, 
change the way that we think about and the way that we, um, we operate and the way that we solve these problems. Excellent, Wendy, and I think you're right. I mean, when you think about the collaboration that's happening around COVID, as you said, imagine if we all put that energy against Alzheimer's, which is just going to be huge. I mean, and instead of doing it very parochially and, and study by study, instead of share, and we don't share that kind of data, but if we collectively work towards some of these bigger diseases, what a better place the world would be. Um, Barry, I've given you a few minutes now, Mr. Al Nilam, um, if you could uh, weigh in, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you also said uh, not likely, which sort of surprised me because you're an optimistic kind of guy. So not that you're not, Mike, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, so I want to I wanna change my, my answer to very likely. Okay. After, after hearing, uh, after hearing you know, Wendy and, and, uh, and Sharon. Now, you know, as, as Mike said, you know, having been in this industry since the mid 80s, I don't think our industry has behaved very well on a number of fronts. We've made life-saving therapies. We've fundamentally changed disease. We've done tremendous, uh, tremendous good for the world. But we've also launched uh, big price drugs for big populations without telling anybody how many people we'd have to treat. That caused um, payers to go in the red um, we've taken price increases. Some companies pay, have taken 10% three times in a year and grow through price increases versus growth through innovation. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical about the industry and the industry behavior. And maybe since I filled out the questionnaire and listened to some of the folks here, we, we are seeing a seismic shift in how our industry is behaving. My, uh, you know, my shock when I came up to Kendall Square in 2000 was, just how unbelievably collaborative the biotech industry was. You could pick up the phone, meet somebody for coffee, ask anybody in a company, they'd show up and give you an hour of their time without payment or I guess a cup of coffee before payment, maybe lunch. Uh, but it was unbelievably collaborative. And, and now we're seeing that on a global scale. It's with COVID, but as you said, hopefully other diseases, the idea that we can share information, the companies would never collaborate before collaborating to, to solve global health is, is to me a seismic shift. And with, with the COVID situation, with systemic racism, if these are not burning platforms for our industry to fundamentally change and not go back to the way it was, because I don't think we can, but move forward in new and innovative ways in terms of um, you know, getting patients di diagnosed properly, getting them worked up properly, getting them the right medicines or tools that they need. We have to have that seismic shift in our industry, uh, in our industry going forward. And, I think we're seeing the burning platform to make it happen. When I see leaders like Michael Dolton of, of Pfizer um, take a global stage on, on health, someone who was not Michael himself, but Pfizer maybe not viewed as innovators, and now Michael and his team becoming innovators in solving the COVID issue, working with companies they might, might not have worked with before. Those to me are signs that we can in fact change. And we can get back to what George Merck said, let's focus on the patients. What our industry did unfortunately was we started out focusing on the patients, then we focused on patients who could pay, and then we focused on revenue. So we went a little off kilter. We need to get back to focusing on patients and doing what's right for patients on a global scale. And if we do that together, as we're seeing with COVID, I think we can in fact change access permanently going forward. Excellent, Barry, thank you so much. Um, you know, this, it's, it's almost like a juxtaposition when we go to our next, uh, our next question here. But, Hearing all of you talk about, you know, even if it wasn't so optimistic, but there is a resounding sense of optimism from you all um, in terms of where we think the industry can go. Um, and you all are leaning into these challenges and, and, and making a real impact. So um, thank you to all of you for all the great work you're doing. Um, you know, question number four, Dan, I'm ready if you are. Let's go. Okay, the question is, will the industry need to rethink its marketing and commercialization strategies? Yes, no, or maybe. Pretty simple. Close the poll, and surprise, surprise, 95% said yes. 5% maybe. Nobody said no. <laughs> so, super panels, let's see what you got. <laughs> yeah. Looks about right. And that was about right, so... We're not getting, this is certainly is not as controversial a question as um, the one before, but I think where we're gonna see the nuances is in how and to what degree. So Michelle, we're gonna kick off with you. 
Great. So um, will they need to? I think everybody already is, right? I think you heard Al talk about how, you know, launching in the middle of a pandemic, how you have to really um, think differently about um, how you launch, launch your product. So, you know, it's interesting. I think what we've seen, and as you can imagine, we have a vested interest in, um, in trying to understand this as quickly as possible, right? So uh, I think we've, we've learned a lot of things. Um, I loved how Craig talked about hybrids. I think we're realizing that uh, digitally enabled and technology enabled field representatives are, the, you know, I think they're here to stay. I think some of Sharon's comments about telehealth and, and physicians, you know, getting really comfortable um, using telehealth has actually created an opportunity for sales representatives, right? Uh, people say the the sales representative is dead, right? You know, field teams are never going to be part of people's commercial strategy in the future. I just think that you know relationships, which a lot of us have talked about um, on this call so far, um, relationships matter, and relationships and and empathetic folks who really understand what physicians are are going through right now matter to customers. And so I think representatives with strong relationships can utilize, you know, more virtual and um, digital tools to access customers and even intersect in the way that customers are now taking care of patients, right? Intersecting in, you know, if you're on a Zoom call, taking care of patients, taking 10 minutes to, to understand, you know, getting some value around patient access or information you need about a new product can be just built into your, you know, workflow. So I, so I do think that, um, you know, representatives or the person who's representing your, your, your brand to a physician, whether it's an MSL, a sales representative, a nurse, whatever the, 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 the focus is, those people have to get really good at figuring out how they work themselves into the workflow now of healthcare professionals. And the empathy piece that Al talked about is so important because you have to understand what's going on with that customer. If that customer is treating a lot of COVID patients, the last thing they want to do is talk to a sales representative, right? And so really trying to understand um, where they are in their journey and in their practice, I think is really important. So I think that that's one key thing. I think intelligence is the, is the next thing. I mean, we have so much data and analytics available to us now and really truly understanding um, what that data is telling us about what what HCPs and physicians are interested in, what medical information they need, what channels do they wanna interact with the pharmaceutical companies with? Do they just wanna to talk to medical? Do they want to really have uh, an increase in patient support right now, understanding what's going on? You know, when you think about you know, value and access strategies, which have been discussed here as well, when you think about it specifically in the US, how many people are filing for unemployment or are changing jobs right now, and what that potentially does to your availability and ability to gain access to medications, that's going to change your commercial strategy. And so um, I do think that um, you know, really being flexible and nimble and listening to your customers is critically important right now. And you gotta, you gotta be kind of brave right now to try new things and let go of maybe some of the things that you traditionally did in you know, your traditional launch playbook. So I do think that um, you know, marketers are reevaluating um, their commercial strategies, um, but I do think that communicating with customers is critical. And you know, based on some of the research that we've done, um, there's still a very high percentage of customers that want to interact with um, an individual to get the best information possible that they need about um, the medications that they're prescribing for their patients. It just doesn't look the way it traditionally did. So. Excellent, Michelle, thank you. It's a lot to unpack there. And you know, as you said, it, it goes across from the HCPs to the customers, to the sales reps, to all those strategies. So uh, Mike, I'm gonna turn to you. And um, you also said yes. Yeah, like everyone, I think. Um, and um, maybe for a different reason, though, because I think that uh, the pandemic, I think, has given us a chance to rethink. I mean, this, you know, we're all in a Zoom call in a way that we would have loved to be drinking cocktails in, uh, in, in New York. Right? We would have loved to be doing that. And I think remote working has been one of those things that uh, we've had an opportunity to, to explore now because of what's happened. I think getting rid of sales reps has been another thing, right? The industry's talked about it for a long time is could you, they're expensive, they don't get much time with physicians, could you get rid of them? So I think if we move that conversation forward and say, well, actually this could be an opportunity to do that pivot, to, to be more agile in the way that we think about it. I think our industry has to move from sales 
to demonstrating and delivering value. I think those two things are fundamental to how our industry uh, improves going forwards. Um, because the idea of selling pharmaceuticals to, to, to physicians has always felt uncomfortable, right? I mean, like the kind of Sackler uh, based uh, orientation of, of, the, of the sales rep, I think uh, has had that problem uh, all of the way through. So I think if we can move from selling to uh, what everyone used to understand marketing as, which is understanding markets. I mean, that's what marketing used to do is they used to understand markets and then tell people all about the products that they could be developing or the way to price them or the way to, to, to demonstrate value. That's the job of marketing. And I think in our industry, it's become sales support, you know, and I think that's why we've had some of this tension. I think if we can move towards understanding value to our customers, uh, understanding markets, understanding wants, understanding needs, I think that's a very good um, uh, way to, uh, uh, so to, 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 to rethink this. And it's absolutely not with, a, not with a perspective that sales reps are in the wrong place. Some of them are very good at understanding the value of their medicines to their customers. But we don't often have a two-way conversation. You know, it's often a one-way conversation. I think it'd be great if 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 they could start to listen as well as uh, as well as talk. Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to do. And actually, maybe you know, doing this remotely might well be a way to enable some of that to happen. But the idea of um, you know, uh, you know, pilot high, you know, go out and throw uh, you know three thousand reps at it, put the ads everywhere. I think that probably is unlikely to, 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 to be sustainable going forward. It never was, but no one wanted to be the first one to change. Excellent. Um, so Al, um, you said yes as well. Yeah, well, I won't leave Mike dangling out there by himself on this one. So <laughs> no, I think we have changed. It's a question of how much, you know, what are we gonna change? I mean, let's all fess up and we call ourselves sales and marketing for big ass little M. Right, we we were good good at sales and not as good at marketing. I think that's out the window. I think um, you know. I think if you look at our, a couple of things we haven't talked about, I think the channels are are going to get disaggregated. I mean, we have three wholesalers we deal with, right? That's it. We think not in my channel. There's a bunch of internet di distribution networks in women's health that are delivering drugs to women's homes. We have a new customer, and we're not we're we're trying to catch up. You see TV ads for Nurks and new, or New RX, however you want to pronounce it. So that's that's disaggregation on its way. Um, and I, I think if you look at the payers, there's three. There's three, not a hundred, three, three. So it just says to me that there's disaggregation. And I think I think the industry has been mass, you know, using mass marketing tools, big sales forces, as Mike said, and you know, like that's over. That's over. I don't think the uh, we're sales reps over, but I think there's going to be a lot more adaptive models in sales and marketing based on regions. And we've been talking about it for years. I think, I think this is, I think this is Excel. I think COVID, my personal opinion, this is accelerated change. It hasn't made change. It's accelerated change. You know, this is the rocket fuel for change. So I, I think the industry is in for a kind of a quick ride with just some potentially disruptive technologies and Amazon wanting to drive, drive, you know, have something a drone, they might be over my house right now for all I know, you know, it's dropping everything from my shoes to my drugs and that's going to be here. So I think that we're going to have to adapt to a new, new distribution channels to do new customer bases and to consumerism. Um, you know, the, the comments earlier about your food in the supermarket are going to be true with drugs too, I think, you know, I mean, um, so I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to adapt. And we're going to have to get out of our mass marketing tactics and for the first time, maybe consider ourselves real marketers and not real sales, sales organizations. So I'd like to see marketing and sales, not sales and marketing. Um, I think we're going to have to be hired better marketers, you know, um, that employ tactics much similar to the consumer industry that has a lot more customization of their, their, their model. So you're not there out there alone on this one, Mike. We'll let, I won't let you dangling. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Jeff? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I guess I, I might take a, I would link it a little bit towards the conversation with regard to market access. I think the likely piece here is the sales model and calling on physicians in, in different ways. Um, so I think, you know, one of, one of the other ways of rethinking marketing and, and you ask commercialization strategies might be on this pricing question and this market access question rather than, you know, in thinking about disruptive uh, strategies for addressing 
price issues and or larger populations or really truly going at risk for the results of the products that we put out there, whether it's through value-based arrangements or not. I, I, I do disagree a little bit with, with all this concept of disaggregation. If anything, and I'll go back to my comments about this vertical and horizontal integration that's taken place. It's only, um, and I agree with Al that there are three payers. In many ways, a lot of people like to think of the, the US, and I know this is a global audience, as a very complicated system with lots of players, but in many ways it is like a national health system, except you've got three private payers that are representing, in many instances, larger populations than most countries like United Health Group that supports more than the health benefits of more than 50 um, mil million people. So I, I think it's actually not disaggregation, it's the healthcare system doubling down on itself and saying this is the way we deliver care. So the, the uh, change in the model will more likely have to come from the farm industry and actually thinking about again in, in this instance potentially different types of pricing models where again you're really thinking about the the total outcome across the system i do think that is a dialogue that is taking place particularly right now as we have more and more expensive therapies and wendy i hate to say in rare and orphan disease i really took your comment to heart that yes there are 350 million you know uh, people I, I i can't remember the exact number that are suffering and, and so when you add it all up it's huge but if you're in one particular um indication of, of fragile x and you're a payer and you have eight patients that are going to take a $2 million drug. When I was at United, the things that we were grappling with were not those eight patients. It was cardiovascular disease and diabetes and COPD. But pharma companies weren't coming to us to talk about those disease states. They wanted reimbursement for Zolgensma for a small portion of the, the population. So I do see an opportunity where the industry needs to think commercialization strategies really from a pricing and, and reimbursement perspective. One, one last point on sort of the disruptive aspects of uh, Amazon and things like that. You know, I, I'm also a little bit of a naysayer there as well. I think this has been going on since 2017. We all point to Amazon as the sort of North Star of potential disruption. But other than, you know, making an announcement about Haven, purchasing a pill pack, it's been over three years now and there have been extraordinarily limited uh, uh, changes there. So it, it may be one catalyst, but I think we're going to have to look for others potentially outside of the uh, Amazon umbrella. Interesting. Um, we can have a conversation. I, I'd love to discuss that more with you um, offline. Uh, Cameron, um, you also said yes. So where do you see our how commercialization strategy is changing? So uh, for a long time, I've thought that we uh, like to think of pharmaceuticals and broader healthcare as some protected species. Uh, in lots of ways, it is a fast moving consumer good to echo something that I heard Al say. Um, the other thing I heard Al say that I'll support is uh, he said he wasn't so empathetic five years ago. And having known Al for a lot longer than five years, I can tell you that's absolutely true. So well done, Al, on growing up at long last. Um, but seriously, there, there are uh, elements that other industries adopt that we seem to have a visceral reaction to. Um, for example, you know, we talked, I think uh, Jeff talked about uh, value-based uh, approaches. Um, what's wrong with a money-back guarantee? So if your television doesn't work, you want it fixed or you want your money back. If your arguably more important um, uh, asset in the shape of your health doesn't work and you're taking something to improve it, why don't you want your money back? Um, I think we're going to be forced to confront that. Uh, and some innovation is going to come from left field so it isn't necessarily what we think of as health care pharma biotech it could be from people who deal with information uh, so google microsoft ibm amazon uh, even facebook and others 
are going to be serious players in some form of healthcare very soon, uh, if they're not already. And in fact, they are already. So uh, the notion of resisting change or uh, we should be thinking about changing our commercialization strategies. If you're not already doing it, you're gonna get left behind. Uh, and what's more, uh, there's, there's a great saying from uh, Alain de Bouton. If you're not embarrassed a year from now from the person you were, then you're not growing fast enough. And I would say that the same applies to our organizations and to our teams. Thank you, Cameron. That was great. Dave? Where are you, my friend? Hold on, I'm still capturing that last comment from Cameron. Um, no, I and I, I couldn't agree with you you more in your, in your last note there, Cameron. Um, I mean, the fact that the world has changed dramatically and it's not going back. I mean, it's 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 tempting to slip into nostalgia, hoping that things will return to normal, and therefore thereby avoid making the the really tough decisions about transformation. Um, there are companies that are still betting on a rebound of the past and they're gonna be left behind. Um, I think you're right, leaders, the leaders have already moved on and are doubling down, um, in many ways doubling down on digital transformation. So emphatically, yes, the industry needs to change. Um, I guess the question that I always ask myself is, okay, so how and in what direction? Because um, every company, every product, every therapeutic area is different. Um, I like to think of it sort of based on a simple question, you know, what's the next value multiplier um, is kind of a jargony way of asking the question. But, you know, back in the 90s, Pfizer broke, cracked the code on the mirrored sales force, and they led the industry in growth for, for many years with a string of blockbuster drugs. And then with rare and specialty, um, RWE back pricing, the advantages of the Orphan Drug Act, they've been vital value multipliers for biotech. I think the next value multiplier is going to explore how the physician and the patient experience has changed and how dramatically it's changed. Um, a couple of you have commented on retail and consumer purchase behavior. Um, those habits are changing. And I think this really suggests that the ways that HCPs and patients consume content and make decisions, make value decisions are also changing. And I really, I think of this as a gift to commercial teams. Um, when there's a sea change like the one that we're going through, there are gonna be moves and changes in industry leadership. Um, as the head of commercial of a small biotech said to me two weeks ago, the industry-wide move to digital has leveled the playing field for her. She can't afford the field force of her competitors, but she can compete in the digital realm. So, um, I don't like to do this, but I'm going to close with a bit of jargon. I think it's going to come down to personalization at scale. Um, it's not just digital carpet bombing as a replacement for sales carpet bombing. It's personalization based on individual HCPs and patients' needs and their individual ways of consuming content. Um, I believe this is going to be fundamental to the next generation of modern marketing, as Ritesh might call it, that will usher in the next growth era. Excellent. Um, Anal, um, let's hear your thoughts about sales and uh, the commercialization strategies. Uh, I wanted to build on what Dave said, and but start thinking about when does commercialization strategies begin? We have talked more about end of phase three and when the product is on the marketplace. We feel that that shaping is going to start earlier. And actually, biotech companies are doing that. You know, they are shaping the market earlier. So that, you know, the segments are smaller. So we have to understand. And that's where also the MD and patient, you know, HCP patient experience comes in. Try to understand it, understand the market, shape the market, and, and, and then think about that behavioral change that is necessary in marketing and commercialization of what the product is going to do, what the benefits are, and how we can move on. 
So that's one thing I wanted to talk about quickly. And the second thing is that there is diversity now. And given the diversity in physicians, healthcare professionals, given the diversity in terms of the overall healthcare industry that is happening, and, and also, you know, including, uh, you know, several, several of us who are also suppliers in a way, uh, it is changing. I think that is also going to change you know, bring a big change. However, that's going to take a long time. As a woman of color, I know it takes a long time to change. We talk about inclusion, but it will take a long time. I think the initial one of shaping the market and defining the market earlier is going to come earlier in terms of the strategies. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that. Liram, we've got you two minutes. All right. So, look, I think it's evidence that everybody's rethinking, evolving, and accelerating plans. These days, we do recommend uh, that people do so in pencil. And I'll start with the optimism, which, which partially builds on the comments that Barry made about the collaboration and changes that we're seeing, but also with confidence derived from the recognition that at the same time that we learn about a lot of society's fragility, we also saw a health ecosystem that demonstrated amazing resilience over the last three months. We've witnessed a shift from surviving to thriving, and, and, and the examples are in abundance. Hospital systems have developed the capability to print parts to reduce reliance on third parties. Research is being done in the open. Timelines have been compressed, better at clinical trials. Uh, uh, even service models for at-home clinical trials have been proven in some therapeutic areas. So as we think about that, product managers probably understand today their supply chain better than they uh, actually likely understand all of their dependencies exponentially better than they did pre-pandemic. And, and I think what's also happening is that we're recalibrating expectation about what's possible uh, in the virtual environment. Craig highlighted that we're likely to see many people with preferences for more hybrid models. Uh, we've also seen a lot of regulatory changes, e-visits, relaxed HIPAA rules, and so on. So these are all going to be hard to put back in the tube, to use uh, uh, Tara's word. If, if we Focus on telehealth just for illustrative purposes. Televisit is actually a great example of how COVID is acting as a fortune function. Uh, and, and it's actually interesting because as, as you change the aperture from a broader statement about telemedicine, but investigate specific use cases or uh, uh, zoom into specific disease states, we actually see a lot of variability in the research that we're doing. We're, we, you know, if you're talking to a physician who was able to refill a script on the convenience of their couch in two minutes, she probably feels very different uh, uh, than an orthopedic surgeon is used to diagnosing by how a person walked into the room or a, a cardio specialist who's learning to expect much more serialized telemetry. And, and remote patient monitoring is not new, but they might find it to be much more insightful than the point in time, uh, more uh, clinical grade diagnostics. And, and, and of course, consumer on demand models, getting patients the care they need, sometimes virtually, and sometimes at the convenience of their home and even basic things like pill delivery. So. I think that there have been some places uh, where we've seen uh, irrefutable experience improvement. And, and I started by saying this is a forcing function. So for the same reason that nobody that's used an iPhone for a year uh, or longer is longing for their fax machine, uh, we think that some of these themes are one-way streets. And, and now to take the other side, we, we also think that uh, with all of that said, there's also uh, a lot of caution, uh, and that's why we're studying the data very carefully these days. I'll, I'll give you one example. As we're seeing many patients returning uh, to visiting their doctors in person. In fact, uh, Epic published uh, data last week highlighting that we saw a peak of telehealth visits in April, uh, where telehealth at that time accounted for 69% of physician-patient visits. But by July, that figure had actually dropped to 21%, so clearly significantly higher than pre-pandemic levels, but also, we need to, to, to carefully monitor that. I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities unlocked in accessibility and diversity in the video with universal conduit in, in recalibrating our perspective on timelines. But I'll close by sharing that on a personal note, I, I've learned that it's a lot more enjoyable to read about pivotal moments in history than to experience them in real time. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and so I'll just circle back to where we started. I, today, plans have to be written in, in pencil, but I, 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 we're encouraging everyone that, that it, it, to treat 2020 as, as not a year of pause, but, but to recognize that this is a year of opportunity. And, and I'll, I'll part with the, I really like Don and Al, uh, what they spoke about earlier and the gratitude and in addition to thanking Karen, Dan, and the Pharma Voice team, I think nobody's more worthy of celebration 
uh, than the front lines in the scientific community. And I think that will create a halo on our brand because it won't be long. And when I say brand, I mean brand of pharma. Uh, uh, it won't be long uh, before we have those victory day parades down the streets of New York, Boston, Toronto, Philly, Chicago, everywhere. And when we do, I think it's going to be doctors and nurses that are celebrated for how they conquered the scariest common enemy that civilization has, uh, has ever confronted. And, and I think we have a lot to be optimistic about for that reason. Excellent, excellent. Great conversation. Um, I think that we're going to see opportunities expand and contract as we go forward. Uh, to your point, Liram, um, we are in the home stretch. Question number five. Dan, hit it. Here's the question. Different types of clinical trial designs are being accelerated in this COVID environment as both companies and regulators realize things need to be done differently. Is this mindset change sustainable for the future? That's a big question. Close it down and share the results. 68% yes, 32% maybe, 0% no. Okay. So, Super Panel, for the last time tonight, let's see your answers. Yes, 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 yes. No, Al Altamari, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, let's, um, so, Craig, let's start with you. You say yes. Tell me Taryn, why. <clears throat> Taryn, my writer says I get at least five minutes for an answer. Um, <laughs> Did the so, great evidence make it to you too? Okay. Look, I, I don't think we have to belabor the point that the pandemic drove some great continuity measures that the industry embraced around for our trials, whether that was around our monitoring practice and, and decentralization. But this was not innovation. This was risk mitigation. This was survival. This was the core mindset that we've had in this industry for years. Um, this was an innovation. It was, it was a story of adoption. We were just picking up the tools that already existed that we never quite got around to embracing. But many in our industry are seizing this moment. And when I talk to ClinOps leaders in different organizations, they tell me, I'm not going back. They're taking advantage of this window of opportunity and they're not letting go. Does that create an automatic mindset shift? Absolutely not, and we can't take it for granted. There is no new normal. There is no sustaining change that's going to happen. None of that happens unless we commit. And we know in our industry what it means to commit to change. We invest in SOP reviews, training. We invest in um, new vendors and new partners for how we operate. We change how we're writing our protocols and we retrain our investigators and how we're eng engaging with patients. That's commitment. And the mindset shift will only stick if we're willing to make that commitment. I see many organizations that are, and I encourage it, those that aren't, don't assume that the change just happens. Excellent, thank you. And Nancy, you said maybe? I think we're well on our way to lots of innovations. This is a path started most recently with 21st century cures and we're, we're in the middle of a transformation. I think this has got legs and it's keeping, keeping going. Um, Barry, you said maybe as well. Yeah, I mean, given the time, not, not a lot to add. I agree with the comments made. And again, it, when, when something like this happens on this kind of scale, it forces us to think differently. And, and the one thing I hope the changes is regulatory sciences around clinical trials. If we can get regulatory sciences to adapt real world uh, data, some of, the, some of the other kinds of trials we're running in the case of pandemic, then uh, we'll, we'll see companies go that way. Um, if regulatory sciences doesn't adapt, this is why the maybe came in, then, then it's a big risk to, to risk drug approval on an adaptive design that regulators may not agree with. And then of course, you've got payers who have to agree with the data at the end of our clinical trials as well. So, Regulators and payers were part of my maybe. I love it. So where's my optimist, Mike? He said yes. Mm, yeah, I was still optimistic about the change that could happen because I think that, uh, you know, we've had an industry that's moved towards, you know, rarer diseases and cancers and making people move to the, to the sites and live there for six months or a year. Well, who can afford to do that? You know, not most of us. Uh, so the idea of, of, of 
flipping the coin from really creating these ideal worlds in which to study patients to moving into the real worlds in which people live uh, and, uh, and have their diseases, uh, study them as they live instead of, uh, instead of making them conform to our world I think, and measure what matters. I think all of those things are possible and I think we've seen the technologies enable some of those things. So it would be a shame if we didn't uh, begin to reflect that uh, diversity within our clinical trial population because we know that we can uh, and, and stop making people bend to, 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 to our rules going forwards. Excellent. Amir, you were a maybe, which sort of surprised me actually. So why maybe? I thought for sure you'd be a yes. Um, why am I maybe? I'm usually not bland in the middle. I just, I think it depends. Uh, I tend to agree with Mike and some of the others. I think the other thing we're forgetting is I think younger patients are very different to people our age. I'm not sure they're gonna put up with the kind of stuff that our generation did. So I think patients really pushing will make a big difference. Excellent. And we're gonna round it out. Julie, I'm gonna give you the last word on our first Red Jacket Super Panel. And you I, said yes. I think it has to be sustainable. Uh, we've got the technologies to automate, to gain efficiencies. We're proving in COVID that we can work differently to solve a complex, challenging issue. It has to, comp it has to continue. I agree. Um, you know, I can't thank you all enough. Um, to bring you all together is really quite special for us and we feel very honored. And I have to tell you, I've been watching with one eye that I have left, uh, the comments that are happening in the chat bar. So while we couldn't get to a lot of the questions, I wanna thank you all for engaging with our audience in this format. I also have to thank Sanovi and so very much for the sponsorship of this panel. Um, we can't do it without them. We can't do it without all of our sponsors, many of you are represented here on our panel today. And we certainly can't do it without you as well as our audience. So on behalf of Pharma Voice, give yourselves a round of applause. This was awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Darren, and your team. Thank you. For more Pharma Voice 100 content, visit www.pharmavoice100.com.